Roman historian Carlin Barton who writes, religio is like pudor, a whole system of emotional, psychological, and behavioral responses to bonds and obligations and their transgressions. It is part of the internalized homeostatic systems by which the Romans governed themselves until the Civil War period. It is in that period, that is the Civil War period, that religio becomes, in the works of Cicero, a disciplinary system imposed by the state magistrates, authorized and reinforced by the gods. For Cicero, the threat to the state from the violence of the civil wars caused him to look for ways to reinforce the authority structures of the state. For him, more fear, more inhibition, more anxiety with regard to the gods and their spokesmen, the magistrates and the priests, were necessary. So while Cicero uses religio in all of its ancient usages, he often explicitly calls it the cult of the state-authorized gods and makes the priests and magistrates to oversee and enforce the cult of which they are the most important part. It was Cicero, and especially the book of Cicero most widely read by Christians, De Natura Deorum, that gave Minucius Felix, Lactantius, and Augustine, and probably Tertullian and Ambrose as well, the word that would become religion. In other words, some, at least, of the important semantic features of our usage of religion were already in place in Cicero's post-Civil War writing. And these were picked up and developed further by Latin Christian writers of the second to the fifth centuries. I accordingly differ with Assad's declaration that when the fifth century bishop of Yavols spread Christianity into the Auvergne, he found the peasants celebrating a three-day festival with offerings on the edge of a march. Nulla est religio in stagno, he said. There could be no religion in a swamp. And Assad concludes from this, for medieval Christians, religion was not a universal phenomenon. Quote. It may be that there can be no religion in a swamp, just as for Gregory, there could be no religion without priests handing down rules. But this does imply that there can be religion other than Christianity, whether true or false, right? If these peasants of the Auvergne were not in the swamp, but on the dry land, then presumably they could have had religion. If he, the Bishop of Yavols, meant that there cannot be any Christianity in the swamp, he could have said that. But that's clearly not what he's talking about. He is implying, rather, that the practices of these swamp dwellers don't even rise to the level of paganism. As David Chittister has amply demonstrated, Christians who explicitly did recognize the existence of other religions, Judaism, Islam, and paganism, nevertheless were quite capable, as late as the beginning of the 19th century, of denying that the indigenes of southern Africa had any religion at all, even an idolatrous one. Right? So my point being that it's possible to have the concept of world religions without claiming that everyone's got religion. And therefore, if in the 5th century the Bishop of Yavol said these swamp dwellers don't, don't have religion, it doesn't mean that he's denying the existence of religions. And <clears throat> I believe that he, what he's saying is that there is a religion, paganism, but these people are too prim primitive to have, to, have, to have even that religion. As he shows there, these early ethnographers would observe that is 19th century ethnographers, would observe various ceremonies but insist that they were not religion. And by this they did not mean that they were not Christian. The concept of religion is therefore not dependent, as is sometimes claimed, on the Enlightenment assumption that religion is simply a natural faculty of all human groups, that all humans have religion. Some humans may have religion, some may not. But religion, in its modern sense, of an organized and authorized system of beliefs and practices about gods, not essentially tied to a particular ethnos or place, already existed in Christian late antiquity. By the end of the fourth century, and in the first quarter of the fifth century, we can find several texts attesting how Christianity's new notion of self-definition via religious alliance was gradually replacing self-definition via kinship and land. These texts belonging to very different songs, indeed to entirely different spheres of discourse, 
heresiology, historiography, and law can nevertheless be read as symptoms of an epistemic shift of great importance. As Andrew Jacobs describes the discourse of the late 4th and early 5th centuries, certainly this universe of discourses engendered different means of establishing normativity. The disciplinary practices of Roman law, for instance, operated in a manner quite distinct from the intellectual inculcation of historiography or the ritualized enactment of orthodoxy. Nevertheless, the common goal of this discursive universe was the reorganization of significant aspects of life under a single, totalized, imperial Christian rubric. And under that rubric, Judaism became the religion of the disloyal opposition. Right? So it's, un, it's un, sub, sub specia Christianitas. But this construction of Christianus, prim, Christianus that pr primarily involved the invention of Christianity as a religion disembedded from other cultural practices and identifying markers. Susanna Elm shows, I, I gotta tell you a story. I like to tell stories. Uh, about 10 years ago, the, the, the child of a colleague of mine was filling out college applications in Connecticut. And he came running in very excitedly, somewhat upset to his father and said, it says what religion I, am I? What should I write? His father said, write ethnic Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> Susanna Elm shows that fourth century Christians were already committed to the idea of religions and even understood quite well the difference between religious definition and other modes of identity formation. Elm argues that the first usage of Hellenism as a denotation for a religion can be found in Julian. His justification for denying Christians the right to teach philosophy is his insistence that only one who believes in Hellenism can understand and teach it. Julian insists that only one who believes in Hellenism can understand and teach it as justification for his denial of the right to teach philosophy by Christian teachers. Vasiliki Limbrus emphasizes how for all Julian's hatred of Christianity, his notion of religion and religious identity had been deeply structured by the model of Christianity. As Limbrus puts it, Christians had never been barred from letters. Not only was this an effective political tool to stymie Christians, it had the remarkable effect of inventing a new religion and religious identity for people in the Roman Empire. I would slightly modify Limbaris's formulation by noting that Julian did not so much invent a new religion as participate in the invention of a new notion of religion per se as a category, as a modality of identity formation and as a regime of power and knowledge. She writes, in particular, Julian echoes Christianity's modus operandi by turning pagan practices into a formal institution that one must join. You now had to become a pagan, be confirmed in paganism, right? to be baptized a pagan, as it were, uh, um, formally attend an institution called a pagan in order to, to be, and this is the way Julian construes, construes his uh, Hellenism. The, the, for those of you who know, I'm not going to go into detail on this, the analogy with Hinduism is absolutely compelling, right? Until the 19th century, there was no such thing as Hinduism as religion. The term Hinduism meant being Indian, right? It meant, you know, uh, eating the kind of food we do, wearing the kind of clothes we do, speaking the languages we speak. Although Julian seems never to have used any word that parallels our word religion, his usage of Hellenismos in its contexts certainly seems to add up to that meaning. At any rate, the great 4th century Cappadocian theologian Gregory Nazianzen so understood him and retorted to Julian, but I am obliged to speak again about the word Hellenism. To what does the word apply? What does one mean by it? Do you want to pretend that Hellenism means a Thresakeia? Or, and the evidence seems to point that way, does it mean a people and the language invented by this people? 
If Hellenism is the Thrasicaea, show us from which place and what priests it has received its rules. Because the fact that the same people use the Greek language who also profess Greek religion does not mean that the words, that is the words of the language, belong therefore to the Thrasicaea and that we therefore are naturally excluded from using them. This is not a logical conclusion and does not agree with your own logicians. Simply because two realities encounter each other does not mean that they are confluent, i.e. identical. Right? So Gregory clearly has a well theorized and thought out sense of distinction between what Thresicaea is and uh, um, and a language and, and, uh, and, and, and peoplehood. And he says just the fact that, that all the people who follow the, the Greek Thresicaea speak Greek doesn't mean that Greek belongs to that Thresicaea. I modified Elm's translations here substituting Thresicaea for the printed religion so as not to prejudice the case. But it seems nevertheless clearly correct to translate Thresicaea as religion here in something quite close to its modern meanings. Gregory has some sort of definition of an object that comes very close to the modern usage of the concept, distinct from and in binary semiotic opposition to ethnos. This goes against the commonplace that such definitions are an early modern product. In other words, it seems fair enough to consider his term Thresicaea as the semantic equivalent, or very close to that, of religion as it functions grosso modo within our semantic systems. Religion, that nominalistic category by whatever name, had been invented by the fourth century, at latest by Christians, enabling them to see and identify a religion called Judaism within their semantic system as well, but not yet within the semantic system of the Jews themselves. Because right? Jews also didn't have a word that means religion. So they couldn't have a word that means the Jewish religion. Since the term Thresicaea is quite rare in Greek prior to this time, it occurs twice in Herodotus, a couple of times in the New Testament, and then Christian writers of the fourth century adopted it. It's also in a couple of inscriptions where it just seems to be uh, sacrifice, cult. cult. I suggest tentatively that it is a calc on Latin religio in its latter meaning. Whether or not this is the case, I note, suggest that, cate that the catechesis in the language marks a catechesis in the conceptual world, an event that we might be tempted to regard as the invention of religion. Gregory knew precisely what kinds of affirmation of meaning must be identified with a practice in order for it to qualify as religion. It must have received its rules from some place, which means some book, some priests, and some priests. He separates the language Greek from the religion of the Greeks and claims that it, as well as many cultural practices associated with it, including philosophy, now effectively secularized, are not tied to the Thrasicaea itself. In my view, this explicit definition makes it eminently defensible to translate the Greek term Thresicaea by our modern term religion, remembering that, for instance, there is yet, as yet, and won't be for over a millennium, a word in Hebrew with any such meaning. But the modern Hebrew word dot, which means religion, occurs in ancient Hebrew just in the sense of law or customs, right? Like dharma, you know, very much parallel to the word dharma. While Gregory's definition of religion is, of course, somewhat different from the Enlightenment Protestant one, right, because it's got a lot of rules and practices, a difference oddly homologous to the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism, that is, between rules of priests and of a faith, he nevertheless clearly has a notion of religion as an idea that can be abstracted from any particular manis manifestation of it. For Gregory, different peoples have different religions, Christianity and Hellenism, and, <coughs> and some folks have none. Once again, we see his Greek approximating the latter meanings of the Latin religio. Right? 